Hello, my name is Andy and I am the Village Idiot. I'm armed with a car and a GoPro and an unhealthy amount of time on my hands. I'm using that time to attempt to visit every civil parish in England. You're watching the West Northamptonshire series, one of the two districts that make up the county of Northamptonshire. With 166 parishes, there's a lot to get through. Let's cross another one off. Welcome back to Northamptonshire, everybody. It's been a while since I've been here, and this, I'm afraid, is gonna be the only time I think I'll make it to Northamptonshire this year. But even so, I've picked a really good one for you here. I'm catching this one on the way back up from West Sussex. And what a nice place this is. We've just had a nice meal in this pub, which you can see in your shot right now. That's the Ekin Arms, and you'll find that in Gayton. Here's my disclaimer for people who may be watching me for the first time. I say things as I would in my native accent and dialect. As a result, I may not pronounce things in the same way as the locals do. Remember, I'm a visitor. It's impossible to know everything. Leave me a comment, spin me a like and bash that subscribe button. Let's get to today's parish video. Welcome to Gayton, everybody. One of at least four villages with that name in England. Arguably, the most famous of the four is the one near Kings Lynn, but that's for another time. This one is in Northamptonshire, and it's five miles southwest of Northampton town centre. The village is situated on a hill close to the larger village of Blisworth. Its name is probably derived from Old English, and it likely means Gager's Farm or Settlement. Gayton was not recorded in the Doomsday Book, but it's known with relative certainty that there was a settlement here long before those times. For that, we have to thank the Romans. In 1840, a Roman building which once stood about 800 yards southeast of the village was excavated here. It's believed to have been a temple, and it yielded a bronze statue and some 4th century coins. Industrially, Gayton has historically relied mainly on three things. One of these was brickmaking. There were once three brickyards in the parish, but they've now all been filled in with domestic refuse. Farming is another, which remains an active occupation, but the third, and probably most important, was iron ore quarrying. In today's special section, we'll be talking about that and just how important it was to Gayton. We'll also be talking about the architect Sir Clough Williams Ellis, who was born here in 1883. Railways and canals feature too. It's all here, so let's go. We begin on the high street at Gayton's one and only pub, the Eakin Arms. It was named in 1906 after a man called Roger Eakin. He once lived at the now demolished Gayton House. There used to be another pub literally yards away from this. It was called the Queen Victoria, but it's now permanently closed. That will be our finishing point. The Eakin Arms can be found at the northernmost point, almost, of the high street. It's a tiny pub and its car park is on the corner of Dean's Row. Speaking of which, here is Dean's Row. Now isn't this just your typical Northamptonshire village street? There was one building in particular along here which piqued my interest. That would be this one. With a cross on its wall and an inscription on its eaves, I reckon this was one of the village's old chapels. Gayton had two, a Baptist chapel and a Wesleyan chapel, but despite digging for both, I couldn't determine which one this was. Nonetheless, an interesting property on a gorgeous street. You know, when I drove into this village earlier, I said to Nikki, 
uh, that uh, I always love these Northamptonshire villages because they're always so beautiful, they're always so pretty. Apparently I say that about every single village I ever go to because I never met a village yet that I didn't like. But you can't deny that Gayton certainly is a beautiful place, especially when you look at houses like this one over here. Look at this one here. Absolutely beautiful. I wonder if the church is beautiful as well. That's the next thing to have a look at. We're going to follow this road that away towards it right now. On the way to the church, we pass the old National School. Gayton still has a school on Bugbrook Road. We'll get to that in a bit. Dean's Row leads us to a road which placed a Jerry Rafferty song firmly in my head for the rest of the walk. This is Baker Street. A left turn here, and then you're treated to a magnificent view. Gayton stands on a hill, and this is what the valley below looks like. I proper love Northamptonshire. The path you're walking on at this point is notable too, I thought. It's not tarmac, it's more like a loosely packed gravel. It's similar along other streets in the village as well. At the end of Baker Street is Gayton Manor. Aside from the church, this is the oldest building in Gayton, having been built in 1540 by Sir Francis Tanfield. It's been added to a bit since then and was fully restored in 1923. It stands at what was the northern entrance to the village, alongside the church and facing Blizworth Road. So when we were sat in the pub just a few moments ago, Nicky was looking at property in this village and Gayton Manor was one of the ones that came up. Apparently it's valued at a cool three million pounds. That's pricey, but it's well worth every penny, I think, to look at it very well hidden away behind those trees as well. I think with three million pounds worth of property, you probably do want to keep yourself a little bit hidden away, don't you? Anyway, right opposite is the church. We've arrived here now. And according to this board here, it's open. That says church open daily between 10 and four. Well, as you can see from the clock, it's about five past two. That means it should be open. Let's go in and check it out. Here we have Gayton's Church, dedicated to St Mary the Virgin. Its font and the base of its tower are Norman, but the upper part of its tower is 19th century. This church contains six misery cords dating from the 14th and 15th century. Unusually, some of them have been modified at a later date, possibly by foreign carvers. It was indeed open, so in we go. You'll have to excuse the glare from the lights here, the camera lens needed a clean. Even so, we can still see some of the church's features. In 2016, a grant of £88,000 was awarded to Gayton to address urgent repairs to the roof. These stopped rainwater entering the church and damaging its valuable and historic contents. On the wall, just before the chancel, there's a tablet which commemorates the village's fallen in World War I and World War II. There are priceless monuments and effigies in here too, to some of Gayton's most important historical figures, including this guy, Sir Philip de Gayton, who died in 1316. Well, Sir Philip de Gayton is not on his own in here. There's a few other people who lie with him. Here's one. This looks like a lady. Uh, there's nothing telling me who this is or was, um, but this is just behind his tomb. There's his tomb right there, and this is her tomb right here. There's also another tomb behind this here. Now, this one doesn't tell me either who it is, I don't think. I haven't seen anything to tell me who it is, uh, but it does say on it, please do not place anything on this tomb. And also, this tomb is made of alabaster, which stains easily. That's just a, a bit of... Um, Bit of housekeeping there i suppose and of course it will go for any church because you find alabaster tombs all over the place don't you we've seen countless alabaster tombs up and down the country so yeah you have to be careful with it because it does stain you can see there are some stain marks here look on the edge of this one let's see what else we've got uh, around got a bit of stained glass obviously we've got the east window which we've just seen there's a couple of coats of arms shields in this one there's couple of coats of arms on the wall here. I can't read what that says because it's too um, dark in here. I couldn't find the lights for this part of the church. I'm sure they're around somewhere. Um, and there's a bit of information probably about this tomb 
as well. In fact, yes, it is about this tomb because it goes, it says here, when the tomb was opened. Again, it's a bit difficult to read, but um, if you can pause it, you never know, you might be able to, to read this. It's certainly too much for me to try and dictate to you. So, but you know, come, come to the church anyway and have a read for yourself. Very interesting stuff. So I've just met the rest of my entourage on this street here near the church. There they are. Give us a wave, girls. <laughs> what they're doing is they're not walking with me for a change. What they're doing is they're walking around the village the other way, basically walking the route in the other direction. Uh, so some stuff they'll see before me and some stuff I'll see before them. And we'll sort of meet at the end and exchange views, I suppose. So I'm going to tread where they have just been down here. There's a path which I need to follow in a moment, which will take us towards the village hall. The path I was aiming for was this, Harris's Lane, which will take us back to Baker Street. It's a handy little thoroughfare, and it's not overgrown either. Bonus. The rest of Baker Street is an eclectic mix of property. There's no one true style here. All of its houses are different, which I think adds to Gaten's appeal. Now, seeing as this area is all housing, here's a chance to mention some famous Gaten residents. They include the academic Henry Montague Butler, who was the Dean of Gloucester in 1885 and the Master of Trinity College, Cambridge from 1886 until 1918. He was born in Gaten, and so too was Sir Clough Williams Ellis. Although he only lived here until the age of four, Williams Ellis gives Gaten a claim to fame. He was to become an architect, known chiefly as the creator of the Italian village of Port Merion in North Wales. He became a major figure in the development of Welsh architecture during the first half of the 20th century. So that last house you just saw is on the corner of the high street which is where i'm standing it's behind the camera right now the last part of the walk will go up the high street back towards the ekin arms uh, but for the moment we're going across towards the village hall which is kind of down there ish you can't really see it in shot at the moment but that's where we're headed there's a park down there and a playground uh, a few other bits and bobs we're going to form a loop around this section before coming back along the high street We're now on the Village Green, where Back Lane, High Street, Bugbrook Road and Eastcote Road all meet. The thatched property opposite is called Corner Cottage. We can tick Gayton off the West Northamptonshire list here because there's a parish notice board. Just a small matter of 158 to go in the district. No big deal. As well as this green, the village also has the Millennium Spinney, which can be found further down Back Lane. Here on the green, there's a few benches and trees which have commemorative plaques. The footpath through it takes you to the Village Hall. This was built in 1957 and its existence is down to Isabel Ratledge, the former sub-postmistress of Gayton, who bequeathed her whole estate to the village for the sole purpose of providing a village hall. Next to it, there's a small park and a playground, which was given a makeover in 2007. Once through the park and beyond the Village Hall, you emerge onto Hillcrest Road, one of the more modern areas of housing in the village. So I like it when landmarks are all clustered together like that because it just makes my job easier, you know, to film all these little interesting bits without having to walk miles. Speaking of walking though, there's not much left to do. It's basically a left turn at the end of this street here, another left turn and then straight across to the high street by Corner Cottage, which was very nice by the way, wasn't it? And that'll take us back up to the Eakin Arms where we began. On Eastcote Road, there's some more cracking views over the local countryside. Gayton's Cricket Club is located on this road too, a little way to the south. Mostly, Eastcote Road is again more pretty residences. Some of these houses have date stones, like this one for example, which is dated 1802. This is also the road where Gayton's allotments can be found. Check out the size of these folks, the long running channel joke is still going. Next, we have a big house on the corner of Back Lane. This is five ways. It dates back to 1721 and has 11 bedrooms. It's worth £1.25 million, according to On The Market. Now we're back to the high street, and here's the book exchange, housed within the old red phone box. 
Last of all, we come to the former Queen Victoria pub. A 120 year old building, the Queen Victoria is now a block of six apartments. When it was a pub, it was renowned for its accommodation and its great food. Okay, and I'm back in the car outside the Ekin Arms. Where you caused a stir in the bar. Where I caused a stir in the bar, according to Nicky. In what way did I cause a stir in the bar? Well, there was a little bit of interest in the fact that there was a man in a high vis walking past with a GoPro, and uh, uh, they thought that you were visiting every country pub in England, and they, they felt that visiting should mean coming into the premises and of course you'd already been in I had and had your lunch and then left us there to start your walk and uh, I sort of stood up just as I was nipping to the uh, little girls room and said he's actually been in here he was just here a few minutes ago and he's actually visiting every civil parish in England yes so those of you here uh, in uh, this lovely village will now know exactly what Andy's doing. Indeed. As far as visiting every country pub goes, I'll leave that to Dale and Holly, uh, the great yeah. the great British pub crawl. If you're not familiar, go check them out. I'll link their page below. Mm -hmm. Now, here in Gayton, I've got one last thing that I want to do. I want to take you to an area where the Grand Union Canal, which we have met before in Northamptonshire, uh, comes face to face with the West Coast Main Line, not the East Coast Main Line. That's the channel favourite. So for the first time, we'll be seeing its Western counterpart. I'll see you there in a moment. Gayton Parish was a major local source of iron ore, which was quarried to the southeast of the village either side of the road to Blisworth. Iron ore quarries began operation in about 1853 and continued until 1921. They began close to the village and gradually worked their way towards Blisworth as the iron ore was worked out. Quarrying was done by hand mainly, but with the aid of explosives. Iron ore was taken away by narrow gauge tramways in wagons, originally pulled by horses. Steam and petrol locomotives took over in 1918. The tramways led to a standard gauge branch railway which ran to the main line. The iron ore was then smelted at Nether Hayford. One of the quarries which operated between 1863 and 1884 had a different tramway which led to another railway, that being the line from Blisworth to Toaster, which was built in 1866. Remains of some tramway bridges still exist today, but the once quarried land has now been restored to agriculture. To finish with, we're taking a drive along Bugbrook Road and up to Banbury Lane. Look left and you'll just about catch the primary school. Gayton School is one of the smallest in the country, catering for around 60 pupils. In the age when schools are merging left, right and centre, it's good to see a small village school still going. Once past the school though, the road begins to taper off into the rolling Northamptonshire countryside. We're heading northwest towards one of the major employers in Gayton, Headlands Kennels, located at Headlands Farm on Boundary Lane. Once on that road, we'll come to a bridge which is traffic light controlled. That's owing to it being quite narrow. It spans the West Coast Main Line, the main rail route from London to Birmingham. This bridge was built to replace a former level crossing on the old route of Boundary Lane. Now, although we mentioned the line in the Killsby episode, we're yet to see it. Here in Gayton, we can put that right. The West Coast Main Line links London to Glasgow, and fun fact, it carries 40% of all the UK's rail freight traffic, as well as passenger trains. Here's the Grand Union Canal, which runs alongside the railway for a stretch here. At Gayton Junction, just to the east, the Grand Union has two marinas. 
One is named Gator Marina, the other Blizworth Marina. An arm of the canal runs from the junction to Northampton through a long flight of locks at Rotherstorp. Overlooking the bridge over the canal, which by the way is known as bridge number 43, is Anchor House. Right on cue, a passenger train flew past on the railway behind. And there we go folks, that's been Gayton. Time for us to cross back over the canal and rejoin the current route of Banbury Lane. Like I said at the top, this is likely to be the only time I'll get to North Ants this year now, but don't worry, I will be back again soon. I hope you've enjoyed this episode as much as we did. See you later all! Thanks for watching this video folks, don't forget to like this episode if you haven't already, it really makes a difference with YouTube. If you're new here, subscribe to the channel for more videos like this and give us a share too if you've got friends who'd like it. You can find all the links to my social media accounts below as well as my buy me a coffee page where you can donate to the channel. Also if you've enjoyed this episode, have a look at some more videos in this series. Until next time, I've been Andy, also known as the Village Idiot, and I'm out. <laughs>